Okay, good afternoon everyone. I'm Richard Sandell. Uh, I'm one of the academics in the school. Um, I, the short talk I'm going to give is one that I would give across all of our programmes. I like to uh, spread myself across each of those, but it's because it's a theme, it's a topic which I think is really relevant to whether you're looking at art museums, uh, other kinds of museums, whether you're interested in heritage or socially engaged practice. So this is um, current research which is feeding into <coughs> teaching across the programmes and you're probably getting a sense from us this afternoon that we cover quite a rich range of topics from what Stacey and Jen have shared with you. Um, so my focus is on the ways in which museums are increasingly caught up with social, political and environmental activism and that notion that museums might be active in trying to change the world is one which is uh, increasingly, well, it's, it's, it's widely felt to be quite a problematic thing. Museums are supposed to be neutral and impartial and trustworthy, and that's seen as being in tension with this idea of being more campaigning and socially purposeful. But nevertheless, um, the idea is gaining traction, and it's something um, we're very interested in here as a school, um, and it's starting to gain traction in other parts of the world and the sector. Uh, the Museums Association, our professional body for museums and galleries in the UK, uh, launched a campaign called Museums Change Lives, which was encouraging museums to take up a socially purposeful role, to explore their potential and to be more open um, and to articulate more clearly how they could uh, inspire people to do things differently, how they could create better and uh, support more diverse and engaged communities and so on. So this is an area that I'm particularly interested in. And in the short time today, uh, the structure of my talk is just two uh, main parts. So firstly, we're going to look at how museums have become increasingly sites of uninvited protest. Um, and secondly, I'm going to look at how museums might initiate that protest, be part of that protest, be committed to a more activist philosophy themselves. So the first is from the outside and the second is kind of from within. So uninvited protest. Um, this slide comes from uh, protesters at the British Museum. You may have seen um, there's a, a, a range of groups now who have become increasingly concerned with the way in which arts organisations of all kinds have been supported and sponsored by oil companies. And so a range of these organisations have done a variety of protests, flash mobs, kind of creative interventions at the British Museum, the National Gallery, the National Portrait Gallery, uh, the Royal Shakespeare Company, a whole range of places. Um, peaceful, creative, but visible protests that try and draw attention to their concerns around museums being caught up with big oil and big oil money. This was a Vikings exhibition and protesters using uh, this familiar uh, logo from petrol stations up and down the country. Um, another one from a similar, um, it's a, a different organisation, uh, Liberate Tate, that in 2012 brought this 16 and a half metre uh, blade from a wind turbine, a decommissioned wind turbine in Wales, scrubbed it, polished it, put it into parts, carried it across uh, the bridge to Tate Modern where it was assembled in front of bemused but interested visitors uh, and concerned staff and they pulled that together and they gave it as uh, a gift, as an artwork to the museum to try and uh, express their discon uh, discontent around uh, Tate's sponsorship um, arrangements with uh, BP and that arrangement has since ended. Uh, it's ended at Tate but it has continued at British Museum and those protests are continuing. And um, for the most part, museums and galleries have been criticised for uh, not engaging with those protesters. They've allowed them to come in, but they've been criticised for not being as open uh, as in discussing their concerns with them as they might. Although to their credit, uh, Tate Britain in, uh, this was, in February 2014, they invited artists to create uh, these gifts uh, using paintings from their 1840s room, 
which were then projected throughout that gallery. Uh, so it was an open call to artists to send in these digital submissions. And they did include, so several of the protesters did uh, BP and oil related uh, gifts, humorous around um, some of these works, and they did include them, so they didn't censor those out. They brought that into the, the uh, projections that happened in that space. My second example of an invited protest uh, is around the kind of narratives that museums produce and is an area that I'm particularly active in researching. So this exhibition is called Hide Seek, Difference and Desire in American Portraiture and it was staged in Washington DC in the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery in 2010 and it was the first major exhibition in the Smithsonian which of course is the big national museum in the US. It was the first exhibition they'd ever staged around uh, LGBT themes, lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender representation, which of course is huge within their collections, but they never brought out those themes. And the exhibition opened, it got some great uh, critical and public reviews, um, and then a few weeks in, the Catholic League mounted opposition to the gallery and the exhibition on the basis of, this is a still from a video work by an artist called David Wonorovich and it's a half an hour video but it features 12 seconds of ants crawling on a crucifix and the, protest, the uh, Catholic League protested that inclusion, said it was offensive to them and their beliefs and they asked for it to be removed and overnight the head of that museum removed it very controversially and un unusually to act so quickly. Um, and in response to that removal of that work, uh, activists uh, protested that censorship. I actually got to interview Mike B, Mike Blazenstein here, who went into the gallery with, they became known as the iPad protesters, so they put the video on iPads and they wore them and inserted them back into the gallery space uh, and gave out leaflets to visitors. And uh, so Mike B is here, Mike I, who is his uh, kind of partner in action on this, is filming him as staff get increasingly concerned. Eventually he's uh, wrestled to the ground and they get arrested for um, that. But it was really fascinating to uh, track him down. Uh, they're not museum people, um, but to talk to him about why it was so important to do that. So they got arrested and removed from the gallery, um, but they didn't stop there, they went off and they raised about $6,000 to create their own Museum of Censored Arts, so they did this legally and they got the permit to have uh, this container here and to show the video outside the gallery, um, but also to document the whole story of that uh, censorship and why they felt it mattered and engage visitors in that. So it's a really fascinating story. So just to kind of flip it for a moment, and an area that I'm really interested in then, um, and my own practice, my own work in and with museums, is part of this trend towards saying, actually what museums say and do can have real consequences, they can really shape the kinds of conversations that we have around difference, about equality, around human rights, and so therefore if we've got that potential to shape the conversations that society has about these issues. We should do it well and we should do it in ways which lend support to people engaged in human rights struggles. So I'm really interested in what we've begun to talk about as an activist museum practice. Um, we can see this emerging around the world in a range of different forms. This is the National Human Rights Museum in uh, Taipei, in Taiwan. Um, it's the, a heritage site and a museum the site of a former uh, prison which housed political prisoners during um, a period of oppression and you can go there, you can see where these prisoners live, you can meet prisoners and you can hear their stories and you can learn about why human rights and democracy is important in Taiwan today and they use the museum and its collections and histories to engage young people around those themes. The Tenement Museum in New York, it's the Lower East Side Tenement Museum, 
which has these amazing apartments which they recreate. Uh, it's a kind of uh, immigrant quarter, and they tell the stories of a range of migrant groups who come to the Lower East Side and set up homes over the last hundred years or so. You get to see those apartments, um, but you also are encouraged to think about that history in relation to present day attitudes towards immigration. So it's using the history to inform our discussions today. You could think about ways in which museums are in, uh, more explicitly and directly taking up equality causes. This is uh, a group of museum professionals last year. It was the first time that they marched in London Gay Pride. And you can see uh, National Archives, the Royal Museums Greenwich, the Science Museum, the V&A, the Tate, Natural History Museum, the Jewish Museum, all of them under a banner saying proud to represent LGBTQ lives. So that kind of commitment to a campaigning cause is one which makes a lot of museum professionals uncomfortable, but increasingly there is this interest in committing to these causes. Our own work, we have a research centre here in um, in the School of Museum Studies and a lot of the research we do is collaborative in and with museums and we've worked around disability and disability equality for 20 years now and what we've been trying to do is reveal the hidden history of disability but increasingly we've become more activist and that we're using those hidden histories to challenge the way we all think about difference and our attitudes to people with physical or mental impairments. So to give you uh, a sense of that, this is the, one of our partner museums that we work with. Amazing museum, if you get a chance. Has anyone been the Hunterian Museum? It's uh, in, to, just behind Hoban Station um, in the centre of London. And it's a medical museum. It's got a lot of body parts and <coughs> surgical instruments and so on. And it tells, there's a lot of uh, material there that relates to people who today we might use that term disabled um, but it often presents them in ways which anger disabled people people are quiet it's been the site of protest uninvited protest so what we've done is partner with the museum bring in research bring in disabled people themselves to say well how would you tell those stories how would you use them differently how would you activate them to challenge audiences about their negative attitudes towards difference today. So we worked with this artist, Matt Fraser, who's um, an actor, a writer, a performer, and we worked with him and with curators in the museum, looking at the stories in the stores, the behind the scenes stories in the collections, and we used that to uh, present a different history, a different story of disability to the one that you see here and to use that to challenge visitors' views and their thinking. And we've taken that forward more recently. We've just this month we've finished a two-year project, again working with disabled artists and activists to tell different stories across a whole range of medical museums in the UK. Um, this was a performance at the Science Museum um, in South, Ken uh, South Kensington that you've been to, many of you, I'm sure. This is a group called Deaf Men Dancing. They are what they say, they are definitely dance, contemporary dance, choreography, but here they're using, so they blend dance and sign language, but they're also using material that they've found and stories and objects from the museums uh, that they worked with in order to challenge audiences about their own thinking and attitudes towards uh, people with hearing impairments. This is a very powerful, very kind of affecting uh, performance. So just to finish, because I know we're, uh, we're out of time, um, some of this comes up really up to date and one of the exciting things I've been doing with students over the last few weeks is getting them to think. We're all, many of us, and I'm assuming many of you, are feeling exasperated, sickened by things like uh, Brexit and Trump. They are scary times that we live in and how are museums caught up in that and what responsibilities do we have to respond Rob um, did an amazing uh, post, you can find that on our Twitter feed, looking at how museums can respond to a world in which hate and hate crimes are rising and how can we respond. And this one was one uh, you can see, uh, so there's only a 
week ago, I think, or something, a couple of weeks ago, we brought this in with students to say, because it came up on my uh, Twitter feed in the morning, uh, the Museum of Modern Art uh, in the US reported in the New York Times, in response to last week's travel ban, we've installed works by artists from the nations denied entry to the US. So museums are normally really slow and they're kind of apathetic about these things, but here was a gallery that acted very quickly to speak back to what they saw as something very problematic, which was Trump's travel ban. But another gallery responded, I don't know if you saw, they took all the works, they took everything off the walls that was made by an immigrant. And they didn't have very much left. They had like one small you know, rubbish painting in the corner or something, I can't remember. But to make these political statements and acknowledge that culture is political. And it's difficult in, depending on what's the, the context that we work in and how we're funded. But what's been exciting is working with students to explore ways in which you can draw on your own values as a museum professional and think about what you believe in and what's important and use that in order to make a small difference in these kind of difficult and scary times. So I'll pause there, but um, it's a theme which is fast changing. Uh, we're bringing in current research to think about it and it would be great to explore that with you if you do come and join us at Leicester. Okay.